So this is the last presentation of the day, uh, and I'm going to talk about real-time audio DSP with Faust and uh, FPGAs. And uh, yeah, so we should be done in about an hour. And after that, if you feel like it, uh, I feel like it, uh, maybe we can go for a beer, <laughs> which is very well deserved after <laughs> this very stressful morning. So. <laughs> Anyway, so this is the outline of this presentation, which is uh, kind of similar to the one I gave uh, to ADC on Monday. Uh, like we were all at ADC on Monday, and so we've all been sort of uh, recycling our uh, presentation. So, uh, so this is what I'm doing too. So first, I will uh, talk about what uh, what's an FPGA. Uh, then I will talk about FPGAs uh, and real time audio signal processing. Uh, in general, you know, and, uh, then I will present the Cephala tool, which is a tool that basically allows you to program FPGAs uh, with Faust. And uh, finally, I will talk about uh, performances, applications, and research avenues for uh, this kind of work. So what's an, F an it's very hard to say, actually, what's an FPGA? So an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. And uh, for those of you who never heard uh, about FPGAs, like you will notice the little dash between field and programmable, which is actually important because it tells you that uh, it's programmable on the field, you know? And so, uh, so basically what an FPGA is, it's like a customizable processor, basically. Uh, I think that's the best way to, to, to see it. So if you think about CPUs or uh, GPUs or microcontrollers, so any other kind of uh, processors, they have a fixed architecture. On the other hand, FPGAs have a reconfigurable architecture. So it means that the way you program an FPGA is by uh, uh, describing an electronic circuit that implements uh, a processor, basically. So it's very, very low uh, level. So to do this, you usually use uh, what we call a hardware description language. Uh, and there is not many hardware description languages. The two most uh, used ones are DHDL and Verilog. And they're completely different from uh, programming languages that you normally use because they're here to describe a circuit. Again, here we're talking about hardware more than uh, software, basically. So. What you have in an FPGA is basically a series of blocks that can be connected together. So some of them can be very low level and they can be just like logic blocks. So logic gates and or uh, XOR or whatever, you know, and uh, but you also have more sophisticated uh, elements uh, like uh, multipliers or uh, which are basically DSP uh, blocks. You also have uh, RAM blocks or like, so memory, you know, and, and you can basically connect all these things together to make your custom uh, processor. So uh, the performances of FPGAs are limited mostly by two different factors. So basically the amount of physical resources you have available on the chip. So, uh, so you have a limited number of multipliers, you have a limited numbers of uh, logic gates. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so you're limited by the, the, physical, uh, the physical resources available on the chip. And you're also limited by the maximum clock at which you can run everything. You know? And so, so uh, number two is more similar to the kind of problems that you run into when you're dealing with a CPU or a microcontroller. But number one is very specific to, to FPGAs. Um, FPGAs provide a high level of parallelization. I'm sure uh, those of you who heard about FPGAs know uh, about this. And the reason for that is because you can uh, uh, create your own uh, processor. You can basically create your own processor with, with as many cores as you want. So they can be like very small uh, and they will have to be very small. Uh, but since you have total control on the architecture of the system, if you want to create a processor that has uh, like thousand cores, uh, uh, you can potentially do it. So, so that's why parallelization works very well uh, on FPGAs. And you can't really talk about cores, actually, you know, like, also, it is an electronic circuit, you know, like, but, uh, but I think that's a good metaphor to understand about how this kind of works. Uh, there are two main manufacturers of uh, FPGAs. Uh, Xilinx is one of them, and they are based in uh, San Jose. Uh, 
they were recently acquired by AMD, and I'm not even sure they're still called uh, Xilinx at this point. So, uh, so, so like AMD is actually interested in FPGAs. Uh, and uh, Altera is the other big manufacturer. It was acquired by Intel uh, like longer time ago, basically. And, uh, and there's other manufacturers, but, uh, but those are like the two main uh, ones. And, uh, there is interest around FPGAs these days because people are using uh, FPGAs increasingly for machine learning because you get potential uh, significant uh, gain in terms of performances uh, if you uh, run uh, machine learning algorithms on FPGAs. So, uh, so there is more and more uh, computer clusters that are actually using FPGAs to train uh, artificial intelligence uh, models. All right. so. Uh, FPGAs offer unique features in the context of real-time audio DSP, which is what concerns us uh, here at Karma, and uh, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what FPGAs can do for you. Uh, the first thing is FPGAs allow people to do sample per sample computation, and uh, there is very, very, very few uh, platforms that can do that. You know, and uh, in fact, uh, FPGA and A6 are probably the, the only one. Uh, and so, uh, so it means that there is no buffering on FPGAs. You can have buffering, uh, and, uh, and obviously you're going to get uh, some gains in terms of performances if you do buffering, but you can totally not do buffering. And, uh, and so it means that potentially you get very, very good audio latency because there is no buffers, you know, like sample per sample computing. Another cool thing you can do with FPGAs in the context of uh, audio real-time DSP is that uh, you can run your DSP algorithms at a very high sampling rate. Uh, and uh, by very high, we mean really very high, you know, and, uh, and so uh, here I'm talking about 20 megahertz, but you can actually go much higher than this uh, if you want to. And, uh, and uh, this has some potential applications. Like you might not want to do it for everything, you know. Like, but in some cases, uh, it can be interesting to be able to run um, uh, your uh, DSP algorithms at such a high uh, rate. They have extremely low latency, which is kind of related to those two factors. Because obviously, the higher the sampling rate, the less latency, especially if you don't have buffers, right? Uh, they have a very large number of GPIOs, uh, general purpose inputs and outputs, uh, which allow them to be directly interfaced to very low level uh, chips. Uh, so it means that uh, if you want to connect a lot of audio codecs, for example, and by audio codecs, I mean like uh, codec chips, not uh, like compression uh, formats, uh, you can do it on an FPGA, which is not necessarily something that you would be uh, easily able to do on a, on a CPU. Um, FPGAs are very uh, well adapted to run audio algorithms that present a high level of parallelization. So, uh, so uh, you can get significant gains in terms of performances if you run, uh, for example, spatial audio algorithms or model synthesis or anything that can be like uh, heavily parallelized. And, uh, and uh, yeah, FPGAs are already used at the heart of a lot of high-end uh, professional audio products. And uh, and I say high-end, you'll see later because I'm giving some uh, examples because. I mean, uh, it, it's not really for everything, you know, like, I mean, uh, you're not going to replace your latest uh, Raspberry Pi or uh, Bella project uh, with an FPGA, you know, like, it doesn't really make any sense, you know, and usually uh, only very high end professional applications uh, require the use of an FPGA. So. Uh, this is an example. So, uh, so you find FPGAs a lot in Dente audio interfaces. Uh, why? Well, because uh, with Dente audio interfaces, you need to process a lot of audio signals in parallel. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, this one, I, I took this picture here at Karma and I found it in, a, in, the, tra in the trash, basically. You know, like, you know, and that's the kind of things that you find in the trash at Karma, you know, like very often. It's like, oh, oh, oh. I hope it was at least a recycling bin. I think it was in the trash. Oh, like, yeah. that's, that's not okay. That's not right. This is electronics recycling. And uh, and so yeah, like the the main use in that case, you know, is the ability of FPGAs to process a very large number of digital audio streams in parallel. 
So that's one cool thing about the FPGAs, like processing or just like having pass throughs of uh, audio streams, uh, like digital audio streams in an FPGA doesn't really consume any uh, computing power. Uh, so it means that even in a very, very small FPGA, you could probably have more than 500 audio streams going in this. Uh, and it could totally digest it because it has a very, very low impact on uh, computation. Well, of course, if you start doing like one multiply on each of them, uh, then you're quickly going to reach a bottleneck, you know, like, but, uh, but if, if they are just pass throughs, uh, the FPGA can actually deal with that very, uh, very well. Uh, here's another example, uh, and uh, that's the Novation Summit keyboard, uh, which is fairly expensive, which is probably why I didn't find it in a trash can at Karma. Uh, and uh, and so uh, so this one is a completely has a completely different application for FPGAs, and uh, and so what they do is that they run uh, digital oscillators at a very high sampling rate. And uh, and so uh, the way I, the way they they actually market it on their website is that they actually run uh, their sine wave oscillators at 24 megahertz, which is very 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 fast, you know, and uh, and that way they get closer to analog, you know, and, uh, and that's kind of their speech basically, you know, which is kind of true as well, right? And uh, and so that's another potential application for FPGAs, like the the fact that uh, you can potentially get a little bit closer to analog than uh, if you are on a a more digital uh, system or like, at least using a CPU or a microcontroller or DSP. So uh, so that's another potential uh, application that people do in the industry. This is just one example. Uh, there is more and more uh, analog, well, or pseudo analog uh, modules for uh, modular synthesizers that are based on, F on FPGAs for this very specific kind of uh, reason. Okay, that's another example. So, uh, so uh, that's the Antelope uh, Audio Synergy Core Series, and uh, this is the first model. But they have many others. They are all based on FPGAs, and uh, the reason why they use FPGAs in their case is more for uh, performances. So, so it's more like for the amount of computation that they can do on board of these little uh, boxes. You know, like so. So those are like the three main types of applications you're going to see currently in the industry. So uh, a lot of audio channels, uh, super high sampling rates, and computational power. All right. So now that the question that all of you is probably uh, asking is. If PGAs are so great, uh, why don't we see more of them? <laughs> and the answer is actually very, very, very simple. And uh, it's because they're very, very hard to program. <laughs> and their architecture is intrinsically low level. And, uh, and usually if you're a software uh, engineer, uh, you don't really understand FPGAs. And uh, I, I don't understand FPGAs that well. Uh, I understand them better now that I've been working with them for uh, four years. But uh, all I can tell you is that everything that you know about uh, software architecture, you have to forget it uh, because it doesn't apply when you deal with an FPGA. And uh, and you can try, you know, because like, uh, now uh, hardware description languages are high level enough so that you can write code that looks more like software uh, but usually it's very inefficient to do it that way, you know, like, you know and so you really have to think uh, in terms of hardware when you deal with FPGAs. And, uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons why people don't use them uh, that much. Anyway, so uh, only thinking about audio systems, this is kind of uh, the global view of a fairly standard basic audio FPGA system. Uh, and, uh, and so usually you don't just have an, FP, an FPGA. Uh, you have an FPGA, but you also have a CPU, you know? And uh, you could just have an FPGA, but, uh, but you know, like most chips, most uh, boards that you get, they also have a CPU built in. And uh, so it means that some operations can be done on the CPU uh, because it's more practical uh, and it's uh, simpler to deal with the CPU and some operations can be done on the FPGA. So uh, uh, usually they share uh, external memory. There is built-in memory on the FPGA, but it's usually not very big. So, uh, so, uh, so like uh, using DDR is always uh, kind of necessary, especially if you do like reverbs or echoes or whatever. 
Uh, and uh, the CPU is usually used as the interface, right? So uh, anything that's higher level gets connected to the CPU. So in this uh, uh, block diagram, uh, I'm talking about sensors, but it could be like a user, like a graphical user interface or whatever, you know, that usually goes through the CPU because it's uh, easier. And then the FPGA communicates directly with the audio codec and uh, because uh, they can really just be wired together. And uh, and so uh, that's why you get uh, such good performances, you know, like those, there is no operating system, there is nothing like this, you know, it's pure hardware. So, uh, so, so that's kind of the global picture of uh, this kind of system. I'm going to talk a little bit about the audio codec after, after that. So, uh, you know, if I don't talk enough about it, maybe you can stop me. <laughs> Uh, all right, so why is it such a challenging task? Uh, well, there are many reasons for this. You know, like the first one is interfacing the CPU and the FPGA is tough uh, because you do it by hand. You know, like uh, there is no like tool to make it easier. You just like do it like as low, like it's as bare metal as it gets basically, you know? And so, uh, so that's tough. Uh, same thing for DDR. Uh, you deal with DDR by hand. So, uh, so you, you don't really have a DMA or whatever, you know, like you just do everything by hand, basically. You know? And uh, and then the uh, same thing for uh, balancing uh, computation between the CPU and the FPGA. You have to make this kind of decisions, you know, like what goes on the CPU, what goes on the FPGA. Uh, and, uh, and there are many reasons why many things should go on the CPU and not on the FPGA. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, like, on an FPGA, uh, one thing that's very expensive is to do um, uh, complex mathematical operations. So say you want to compute a sine function, uh, just like call the math sine function on an FPGA, you can do it, but it's going to take uh, maybe 50% of the space on the FPGA just to do it. Uh, and so uh, so like it's a very bad idea to do it. You know? like, so, uh, so if you have a filter, for example, uh, you probably want to compute the coefficients on the filter uh, on the CPU and uh, and then provide a very low level well, coefficient values to the FPGA. Uh, I, I will give you like a, a more advanced example of that uh, later during this uh, presentation. So yeah, design choices, sorry, uh, interfacing the FPGA with the audio codec chip is also hard, you know, because uh, you really have to write your drivers by hand and you know, like your I2S transceivers and all these things, they all have to be written in VHDL, you know, and, uh, and so, so it's not straightforward. Uh, you have to deal with clocking issues all the time because uh, that's one of the thing with FPGAs, you know, like everything is clocked. You know, uh, it's like a big clock, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, so there are many different clocks running in parallel and, uh, and this is potentially hard, especially if you want to have like accurate sampling rates or things like this, you know, and, uh, and you have to deal with very low level problems, basically. Uh, you have to deal with hardware description languages, which most people don't know. Uh, and also, because you deal with those very low uh, languages, you also have to deal with fixed point arithmetic. Uh, on an FPGA, you can do floating points if you want to, but it's not a good idea uh, because it's not going to be very efficient. Uh, so you should do fixed point. And, uh, and as many of you probably know, doing fixed point audio DSP, it's not fun or maybe it's fun for some people but uh at least uh, i don't find it like very fun so <laughs> so so it's tough uh yeah i already talked about this one thinking uh programs as a hardware circuit instead as a software you know like that's a big point you know, and many other problems you know so those are all the reasons why usually people don't like to use fpgas to do audio uh, uh processing so uh, this is an example of an FPGA board, uh, such as the one that we've been using uh, for uh, this project. And uh, so it's a development board provided by Digilent, and it's based on a Zybo Z7, which is a Xilinx uh, FPGA. So the FPGA is just the thing in the middle here. Uh, it also integrates the CPU and it's, you know, it's basically just like a, a Raspberry Pi, you know, and uh, except that there is an FPGA on it. Um, you can run Linux if you want to on the CPU, not on the FPGA, right? And uh, and so, uh, so uh, yeah, those cost about $200 just to sort of give you like uh, 
uh, a ballpark for for this and uh and they're like metal range fpgs so they're not very powerful but uh, you know they're powerful enough so that uh you can run uh Judas's mini mug uh synthesizer on them you know i can uh, and so uh so that's uh reasonable all right but we have faust <laughs> to help us uh, go through all these problems, you know? And, uh, and so this is what uh, I'm gonna talk about now. So we've been working on this project called Cifala and, uh, and it's a tool chain, basically it's open source. You can uh, get it on the web uh, and it basically allows you to program uh, FPGAs with Faust. Um, so you can find it on GitHub, and uh, currently it supports the Zybo Z7, Zybo Z7 FPGAs, as well as the UltraScale Genesis FPGAs uh, series, and uh, those are very powerful. They're also very expensive, uh, and like the price range for FPGAs goes literally from twenty bucks to ten thousand. Like so, it's very very wide, you know, and uh, and I think it even goes further than this, uh, and so uh, so it really depends on how much uh, hardware you want on your FPGA. Basically, uh, Cifala heavily relies on uh, this thing called high level synthesis, uh, which is a tool provided by Xilinx, uh, and uh, so what high level synthesis is is that it allows you to program FPGAs in C++ uh, using a very, very, very specific set of functions. So, uh, so it's not like normal general C++. So, so we developed a specific Faust backend, uh, a little bit like uh, what David did for um, uh, Jax. Uh, yeah, there we go. So, uh, so, and it's a very specific Faust backend that targets uh, this uh, high level synthesis uh, thing, basically. So, uh, the yeah, that's kind of a funny thing about FPGA. So, like when you compile something on an FPGA, you call it an intellectual property, and uh, and so like the like a compiled object on an FPGA is an, an, an intellectual property, and uh, and so like until very recently, FPGAs were uh, everything but open source. You know, like it was kind of the opposite. You know, and. Uh, and now like it's becoming a little bit more open source. There are some uh, open source projects around FPGAs, you know, like, but, uh, but clearly uh, FPGAs uh, at the origin were not really for uh, this community here. Um, and, uh, and so this is kind of what we do. We go from Faust to C++, uh, then we go through HLS and then uh, we generate an intellectual property. Uh, uh, yeah, so we developed a specific Faust backend for this, and uh, and the specific Faust backend uh, is smart enough to sort of separate what needs to go on the CPU and what needs to go on the FPGA. So all these hard design decisions that I was telling you about earlier, Faust does that automatically for you, uh, or at least tries. Uh, and uh, sometimes you have to force it a little bit, you know. Like, but uh, but basically, Faust actually generates uh something for the cpu and for the fpga uh cfla supports various external audio codecs and uh so the main reason why we're working on this project is uh because of uh, latency and because we want to do active control uh and i will talk more about this later uh during this presentation but uh but so the uh the audio codecs that we've been supporting so far are audio codecs that are specifically designed for low latency. And uh, there are not many. Uh, there is more and more coming on the market, uh, but people didn't really care about this until uh, uh, some companies started making noise canceling headphones. Uh, and, uh, and you know, like to do active control, uh, you need low latency. And so, uh, so analog devices is clearly the leader on the market for this. And uh, they provide two, uh, I think there is more now, but like at least uh, like two years ago, those two models of audio codecs were the ones that uh, really uh, interested us. And, it's interesting, you know, because like, most people think that audio latency comes uh, from uh, buffering, which is true, you know, like, I mean, buffering uh, is a big source of latency, but it's not just that. <laughs> and, uh, and so you can't just be like, oh, I got like 16 uh, samples buffer and uh, I multiply this by two and that gives me the latency depending on the sampling rate of my system, you know, and uh, 
uh, audio codecs themselves add a fair amount of latency in addition to this. And, uh, and this latency comes mostly from uh, the uh, interpolation filters uh, that are used by the audio codecs, which are digital filters. And because uh, they want to make them uh, cheap, uh, they use super high order filters. And because they're super high order filters, they tend to add latency to the system, you know, and uh, and so those uh, codecs have uh, the specificity that they have very complex filter architectures uh, that are not very high order, and so they can have less latency. And so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, like the seventeen eighty seven uh, is told to have a pass through latency of only ten microsecond, which is very very low. Uh, as long as you run it at a very high sampling rate, like 768 kilohertz. Did, did that answer your question? Or... Okay, sorry, that, that, that's what I said at the beginning of the presentation. So, so audio codec is a very ambiguous term uh, in this field because uh, it designates two different things <laughs> uh, which are completely unrelated. So, so an audio codec, uh, if you take Marina Bossi's class, uh, is a, like a compression format uh, for compressing audio. Uh, if you talk to a hardware person, an audio codec uh, is uh, basically an audio ADC slash DAC. So like it's the chip uh, that you have uh, inside audio interfaces to do like uh, audio uh, analog to digital version, basically. And, uh, and they're called audio codecs. Maybe someone knows why here. I'm not really sure. But, uh, yeah, and they were decoded. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a coder decoder. Yeah. You know, that's where the word comes from. So yeah. Coder comes in eco Yeah. 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 So it started yeah. out as hardware, and, and now you also have software codecs. You know. Yeah. So it is a form of coder or decoder. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, what's the motivation of having any kind of filter at all? Is it, is it mechanical? Or is it no, 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 no. So like when you do like digital to analog conversion, uh, usually uh, you use like internally in the audio codec, uh, well, you have different ways to make DACs, you know, and like, for example, Sigma Delta is one of them. And so it, it's like a form of PWM in a way, you know, like or PCM or whatever. And so what you get is something uh, that uh, is not interpolated. And uh, in, in order to interpolate uh, that, you need to run the output of your DAC into uh, a filter, uh, which is basically a low pass filter. And, uh, and so that filter will make sure that your, uh, the output that you get, like the analog output, is properly interpolated. And so. Uh, it's kind of like if, if you're saying the speaker membrane needs to move this much, just because you tell it to move that much doesn't mean the DAC is going to move that much. On some, on some fancier codecs, especially the ones you see on like laptops and stuff, uh, the codecs have like value add features where they can drive the speaker harder than it actually can and it makes it sound better. It's it's just that uh, like if you don't run uh, the output of your DAC uh, into a reconstruction filter, like if you look at a sine wave, it's still going to have like little steps. You know, and uh, and so like the filter just smooths it down basically. You know, and uh, and that filter uh, induces uh, latency, uh, depending on how it's implemented. And do you know what method they use for D to A conversion? Oh, they all use. So that's actually a very interesting topic too. So because uh, we learned a lot about all this, you know, and uh, and so uh, so almost. All audio codecs on the market use Sigma Delta, yeah. and uh, and there are very interesting articles about this from uh, the beginning of the '90s, where uh, people were arguing about this. You know, and uh, and uh, it, like it was a big topic at the end of the '80s, where people were like, "So everyone is going towards Sigma Delta to make uh, A to D conversion or or D to A conversion or whatever." And uh, and so like why is this not a good idea you know and because uh, there are other techniques you know and uh, and so a lot of people were complaining about this and uh, and it looks like uh, sigma delta one you know <laughs> yeah it's only one bit and it's super high frequency so it's like you know if you have a sampling rate of like 100 megahertz even if it's only one bit you can um, 
you can preserve the audio at the end using the uh, noise shaping on the quantization yeah. or and so uh so like this computer, your smartphone, uh, everything in this room uh, that is digital audio is Sigma Delta, probably. And that's the way to minimize the hardware. Yeah, and that's the way to minimize the hardware, absolutely. It's just simpler to make Sigma Delta. Uh, but but in, in the Sigma Delta case, you don't need much of a filter. And historically, it was just an RC filter. So there's not a lot of delay there. It depends on, well, it depends on the frequency at which you run your Sigma Delta. Uh, and, uh, and it also depends on what signal to noise ratio you want in the end, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so like, it, it's kind of a weird thing. Like the, there's really this sort of, depending on the order of your Sigma Delta, uh, cause you can have Sigma Delta of uh, different orders. So depending on the order of your Sigma Delta, uh, depending on the the frequency at which you run you run your sigma delta, uh, you get different signal to noise ratios. You know, and uh, and I think if you like if you use fifth order sigma delta, which is the standard uh, used by most audio codecs uh, nowadays, uh, and you run it at like two hundred megahertz, uh, which is kind of what you need. Uh, in that case, you don't really need uh, a filter. Uh, but uh, with that, you probably get a signal to noise ratio of 60 or 70 dB. Uh, if you add the filter, uh, then you get down to like 120 dB or something like this, you know? And, uh, and so it depends on what you want to do, you know? Trade offs, trade offs, trade offs. Yeah, trade offs, trade offs, <laughs> trade offs. So. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk more about this uh, later. Like, I'm happy to like talk more about this. Like, those, uh, again, like we spend a lot of time uh, investigating uh, this, you know. And so, uh, uh, yeah. So another thing that we did is uh, providing a series of uh, open source modular uh, sister boards for this. And uh, I will show you a picture of one of them after that. This is for control. And uh, yeah, the CFL tool chain can be uh, optionally used with embedded Linux as a hardware accelerator. So this is a new feature that we added to CFL very recently. So, uh, so you can run Linux on uh, the board that I just showed you before. And uh, with all the benefits of running Linux, you know, and, uh, and then all your audio DSP is being computed on the FPGA uh, completely outside of the operating system. And, uh, and so, uh, so, so this is a new feature of CFELA that was added just like uh, uh, two months ago or something like this. So all in all, this is kind of what happens. So we take a FAUST file, uh, it goes to the FAUST compiler. And then the FAUST compiler will generate two files, uh, one for uh, the FPGA and one for the ARM processor. And uh, this one is standard FAUST C++ backend. This one is a specific HLS C++ backend, uh, which then goes into Vivado, which is the uh, tool uh, used to compile or synthesize, because that's how people call compiling in the in the FPGA world, which is very confusing. Again, you know, like it's like because it's like we're synthesizing synthesizing things for audio codecs, you know. You know so anyway, and uh, so this is kind of the global architecture of how everything works uh, within uh, CFLA. So I'm gonna give you a basic example of what happens, and uh, this is a very very simple Faust uh, program uh, that that presents different features, you know, and they're very specific features. Uh, so for those of you who know Faust well, you can see that this is not like completely standard because uh, first we're using a sine wave oscillator, uh, which is not based on a wavetable, but which is actually based on a filter and uh, Julius wrote it. So uh, he can probably tell me more about it. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why we're using uh, this specific oscillator is because we don't want to do memory accesses for uh, the oscillator. If we were using the uh, standard Faust oscillator, just like David um, explained earlier in his presentation, uh, it's based on a wavetable and it's not necessarily a good thing uh, if you want to get a low latency on the FPGA because uh, the wavetable would go in DDR, which would mean memory accesses, you know, and so by using a sine wave oscillator based on a filter, you make sure that everything runs just on the FPGA. Okay. Uh, then there is another feature to this Faust code, which is that it has an echo with a delay and the delay is too big to fit 
in the memory of the FPGA. So it means that uh, this is going to have to go to DDR. And, uh, and so this is why like this is a very specific uh, example. Uh, yeah, so I just sort of explained all this, so I probably don't have to uh, go back to this. The slides are available uh, online, you know, and uh, I'll give you the, the URL at the end of the presentation if you want to get back to uh, get back to this. Okay. Oh, and of course, uh, there is a frequency parameter uh, that we want to potentially control, you know, and that's another feature of this uh, code. All right, so what happens in this case? Well, the filter coefficients for the sine wave oscillator are going to be computed on the CPU, right? Because this oscillator is based on a filter, okay? And to convert the frequency into filter coefficients, uh, you need to run complex mathematical operations. Those operations will be computed on the CPU. Faust makes uh, these decisions automatically. You don't have to think about it. Uh, then on the FPGA, the echo and the oscillator will be ran, okay? And uh, the delay of the echo will go in DDR because it's too big to fit on the FPGA. And, uh, and so uh, basically Faust makes those decisions automatically, you know, and, and that's kind of the power of Cephalon. You don't have to sort of do this by hand, you know, and, uh, and hopefully it does a good job at it. Uh, not always, <laughs> but uh, but it's getting better, you know, and uh, and so uh, so uh, so this is just like to sort of give you an overview of what happens. All right, so uh, one of our PhD students in the team uh, is a very good uh, hardware uh, engineer and uh, like uh, electrical engineer, so he likes to make things like this. So. Uh, so, uh, so we're uh, providing as part of Cifala a bunch of uh, sister boards uh, that you can download, uh, have printed somewhere else and then assemble, and that can be connected to those FPGA boards to control different uh, parameters, you know, and, uh, and this PCB is pretty cool because it's completely modular, so if you want to put sliders, you can, uh, if you want to put well, like linear potentiometers, you can. If you want to put rotary potentiometers, you can. If you want to put buttons, you can. So it's like make your own PCB and put whatever you want on it, you know. And uh, and so this is kind of uh, this is kind of fun. All right. So what do we get in terms of performances? What are the applications and uh, research avenues for uh, this uh, project? So uh, one of the main application, as I said earlier, is ultra low latency. Uh, and this, uh, the main application for ultra low latency is active control, right? So uh, yeah, when you use uh, FPGAs with audio codecs optimized for audio latency, uh, then you get very good latency. And, uh, and so uh, currently the best that we got using audio codecs uh, is a latency of 11 microsecond round trip. So that's what we measured. And that's using the uh, ADAU1787 uh, running at 768 kilohertz. Uh, and uh, and so uh, so this is very close to uh, the pass through latency of the audio codec. So it means that basically uh, Cephala and the FPGA only add one microsecond of latency to the system uh, if you use uh, this audio codec, which has a pass through audio latency of about ten microsecond. Uh, it's very easy to well, it's very easy. No, it's possible. <laughs> It's possible to uh, use uh, many audio codecs in parallel on an FPGA, you know, and that's what those Dante audio uh, interfaces are doing, right? So, uh, so it means that if you want to create uh, a board uh, that has, say, 32 audio inputs, uh, 32 audio inputs uh, with 11 microseconds of latency and running at 768 kilohertz, you can do it, you know, and uh, and that's not something that obviously would be straightforward to do with any other uh, platform. Um, yeah, and uh, most of the applications for this are around active control, and uh, we want to do active control for uh, augmenting musical instruments, for noise cancellation, and also for room acoustics, you know, and, uh, and it's kind of a very hot topic these days, you know, and uh, there are also more industrial applications to this, you know, like people are starting to do more and more active control for like cars or like uh, airplane jet engines or things like this, where, you know, like you just do active control to prevent uh, vibrations. So in this context, uh, we 
uh, got uh, a grant uh, two years ago uh, to work on this project, which is called the Fast Project, which is a very bad name because uh, it's very close to Faust, you know, and, uh, and so uh, it's a big source of confusion uh, for people when we talk about it. Uh, and uh, this project gathers a bunch of institutions, so Gram, uh, Insa, Inria, and LMFA. LMFA is an uh, um, acoustics lab uh, based in Lyon. And uh, so they take care of the uh, active control uh, part of things, and uh, and everyone else it, like works on the FPG. So, uh, uh, so yeah, we got funding for this. So we have two PhD students, one postdoc, and uh, an army of interns uh, working on this uh, currently. And so, uh, so this is kind of the global picture of what this project is about. You know, so. So we can program FPGAs at a very high level for uh, uh, artificial reverberation, noise cancellation, virtual acoustics, or active control uh, applications. And uh, and so uh, so this is kind of the the global picture of this. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can visit uh, the website of this project, and uh, or you can talk to me. You know, I can tell you more about it. So uh, as part of FAST, uh, we've been developing this uh, beast, uh, which is a 32 by 32 uh, audio interface for our FPGA uh, with only 10 microseconds of latency. So um, it's, uh, it's ready, it's working, uh, but it hasn't been fully tested uh, because uh, the PhD student who worked on this uh, is currently at Karma and uh, he's doing something else now. <laughs> so, so when he will be back in Lyon uh, at the end of June, uh, he will uh, get back to this, you know, like, but, uh, but yeah, like he didn't have time to finish assembling this and uh, we didn't really have the tools to do it here. So, uh, so like right now it's uh, on his desk uh, in Lyon and, uh, but uh, yeah, probably by uh, the end of the summer, this thing should, uh, should work. Uh, one thing that's really cool about this is that he developed breakout boards for those uh, ADAU 1787 audio codecs. Uh, and, and those are the different breakout boards that you see here. And so this thing is completely modular. So depending on the kind of application that you want to do, uh, it's very easy just to reassemble those breakout boards for those audio codecs if you want to add more inputs or more outputs or, uh, or um, yeah, do uh, all sorts of things, you know. And uh, one uh, breakout board costs about $15, so it's very cheap, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so you can get like this low latency for actually not a lot of money, which is kind How of. Big is that? that? Well, those things here are uh, quarter inch jack uh, uh, connectors. Uh, so that sort of gives you an idea. So it's like this. Uh, ultra high audio sampling rates is another uh, application that we're considering. So, uh, so we have currently a collaboration with Victor Lazzarini and Joe Timoney at Minot University in Ireland uh, on this. Uh, and so we've been uh, implementing our own Sigma Delta uh, ADCs and DACs on the FPGA because that's one of the cool things that you can do with FPGAs. You can actually uh, code uh, your ADC and your DAC directly on the FPGA. Um, so uh, for this, you need very few electronic components. Uh, you only need uh, basically, uh, well, an RC filter, you know, and so like one resistor and two capacitors, like uh, one for the filter, one for a DC offset. And, uh, and so uh, and as Judith pointed out earlier, like you don't even really need them uh, if you don't care too much about your signal to noise uh, ratio. So, uh, so uh, currently we have a prototype of this which is running at 25 megahertz so uh, so you, it, it, it works you know and uh, but it's only for DAC because for ADC it's a little bit more complicated and uh, if you're interested later like you can come and talk to me about this like because uh, I have like so much to say about this topic you know and, uh, and uh, but uh, but currently we only have the DAC uh, and uh, and we're uh, currently working on the ADC so Currently, we have a measured SNR of uh, 96 dB, not minus uh, 96 dB, uh, with a sigma delta of uh, fifth order. And, uh, and uh, we know that we can uh, get it down. And, uh, and latency is way below one microsecond because uh, 
audio sampling rate is so high, basically, in that case, you know, and so, uh, so, uh, so this is pretty uh, exciting, and we're currently working on the ADC uh, for this, and, uh, and so hopefully, uh, eventually, uh, we can just completely get rid of uh, audio connects, basically, you know, and, uh, and just have everything just done on board uh, of the FPGA. Um, another project that we're working on is Plasma, uh, which is an associated research project between Karma and uh, and uh, Emerald, which is the the Inria slash Insa slash Gram team uh, at uh, in Neon uh, that works on Faust and on all these things as well. So uh, the idea of uh, Plasma is that. You can find very, 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 very cheap uh, audio codecs uh, on the market, uh, and uh, that provide a TDM, uh, which is time division multiplexing. So, so you can connect a lot of audio codecs to an FPGA as long as they support TDM. So, TDM is just like multiplexing for uh, audio codecs uh, in a way. Okay. Uh, FPGAs have a lot of GPIOs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 32 for the Zybo Z7 and more than 100 for the Genesis. Uh, and, uh, and you only need uh, three GPIOs for 16 audio channels uh, if you use TDM. So you can do the count, you know, if you have 100 GPIOs and you only need uh, three GPIOs for 16 audio channels, it means that you can get a lot of audio output uh, out of the system. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've been uh, having fun making this thing here. Uh, and uh, so it's a very, very, very cheap um, WFS system based on an FPGA. So uh, for those of you who don't know WFS, WFS is wave field uh, synthesis. And uh, what you do with WFS, uh, it's kind of, so it's very similar to beam forming that uh, David was talking about earlier. And, uh, and so, uh, so basically what you do is that you synchronize uh, speakers so that they have uh, one single common wavefront and you can control the shape of the wavefront. Uh, and uh, and uh, with that, you can, for example, uh, create uh, effects where uh, you hear sound coming from behind the speakers or things like this. Uh, and so, uh, so WFS systems are notorious to be expensive uh, because you need a lot of speakers, uh, you need a lot of amplifiers, and you need a lot of audio outputs. And uh, and audio outputs are expensive uh, if you use a CPU or if you use uh, uh, standard platforms. However, uh, luckily on Adafruit, <laughs> you can find uh, those little uh, I squared S amplifiers. So they're digital amplifiers for only uh, six dollars, and uh, and like uh, a year ago, they were only three dollars. Uh, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's still pretty cheap, you know. And uh, and so uh, and they're uh, TDM enabled, so it means that uh, you can connect lots of them to an FPGA, you know. And so. Uh, so here, uh, this WFS system based on the FPGA uh, that we've made only cost with the FPGA $400 uh, and uh, everything included, speakers, everything. It, it, they're not very good speakers, but, but, <laughs> but, but still, you know, like, so, so for very little money, you can actually have a WFS system, uh, which is uh, programmed in Faust and, uh, and uh, controllable with uh, Linux, basically, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, so that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so that's another application that we're exploring, and that's something that we're doing as part of Plasma. So uh, yeah, this is kind of a performance overview. So I'm not sure, I didn't really talk uh, too much about the performances in terms of computational power, because uh, it's very hard to give uh, uh, good figures about this, because uh, it really depends on so many factors. It depends on uh, how much you can parallelize your algorithm, uh, like what kind of operations you're doing in it. You know, like so. So it's not like with a CPU where you can be like, oh, I can run, uh, you know, like 600 sine waves on my CPU or something like this. You know, like here it doesn't really work like that. You know, and uh, and so. Uh, for some uh, algorithms, you get significant gains of performances. You know, you can run things that you would never be able to run on this laptop. Uh, but then for other algorithms, especially if they're very sequential, uh, then uh, you better run them on laptops. You know? like, so it really, 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 really uh, depends. Uh, 
Also, we're making progress still on uh, optimizing the system, and uh, and currently it's still not completely uh, optimal. You know, and uh, so uh, so one of the things that we're doing to make this better is to generate fixed point C plus code uh, with Faust. You know, and Jan talked about this this morning, uh, and uh, it's a big uh, topic for us uh, these days. Uh, in Faust, there is only floating points, you know, and uh, which is better, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, for FPGAs, you want to be able to deal with fixed point, and uh, and you want to have C code, uh, which is completely fixed point. And in order to do this, we need to do interval calculations. We need to do this recursively, and so it's not uh, easy. And uh, and so we have a postdoc working on this topic right now, and uh, and uh, she's. Tough, but she's suffering. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, so uh, so that's uh, one big. Uh, so we already have a prototype of this, uh, but it's still not perfect. You know, like, I mean, uh, its signal to noise ratio is not super optimal. Yes. So so how was, how are you able to? Well, you mentioned interval. Um, how are you able? How do you determine the bit width size and where the binary point goes? Like. It seems like in, in Faust you're going to have like signals that are going to be all different kinds of ranges. So, like it's fairly straightforward if your algorithm is not recursive, uh, because Faust, the Faust compiler breaks down what you write in Faust into a very low level representation uh, of your algorithm as a big DSP graph, basically. You know, and. Uh, and, uh, and once you have this uh, DSP graph representation, it's fairly easy to sort of uh, recursively go back in time and see like how much uh, precision you need for uh, every single branch in your graph, right? Precision, uh, precision or dynamic range? Uh, precision. Yeah. About, so like if, if you have, say you plug something into an oscillator and it's modulating frequency in Hertz, like then, um, but then the rest of your audio is you know zero minus one to one. What are you? Well, you it move the binary point around as we. So the the way so the way it works. Uh, we, we never when we do this we never go through floating points. You know, so because uh, on an FPGA uh, there is no like proper data types. So it means that uh, you can be like, oh, I have a signal, and this signal has a precision of 200 bits. You know, uh, you can do it. You know, and so uh, and that's and that's the way you do it actually. And so uh, so like we sort of make an estimate of how many bits we potentially need for a specific signal in the DSP graph. Uh, and uh, and then we uh, instantiate on the FPGA uh, like uh, a, a stream that has like uh, maybe 200 bits of uh, precision, uh, but it works well uh, for very specific cases for now. But there are some cases where it's very hard to do the interval calculation basically. As you it's different bit widths are scaled differently, is that or not? Or they're all you just you just keep adding. Uh, I mean, is there a place where, like, um, um, you have, uh, you know, the lowest level bit equals, you know, you know, two to the minus twenty-four, and in other places it's just two to the minus sixteen, or something like that. Or were you always saying it's it, this is always two to the minus twenty-four? We're just going to add bits on the. We we just add bits just basically, add bits, yeah, so. for now, uh, but. It's uh, like it's working for uh, very specific cases for now, but uh, but like it's not generalizable for to everything at least for now. You know, and we hope we're going to be able to do it. But uh, but like there are many cases where uh, you like it, you lose too much uh, precision, like for especially if you change the parameters a lot. But, uh, but yeah, GDX. Um, well, first of all, what are the cases that are working? I'm just curious. What, what cases are well taken care of in the current paradigm? So uh, anything that's not uh, too recursive uh, works well, you know. Like so, uh, so like FIR filters work pretty well. 
but uh, IIR filters don't work well at all. So uh, and uh, and uh, anything that's very nonlinear doesn't work at all too. You know, and so uh, so like oscillators, uh, as long as they're uh, very constrained. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, FIR filters work, but uh, but it, it's still not like perfect. So uh, so um, my understanding is that it's based on the uh, Faust has always had this interval calculation that it's done, right? So yeah, so it, it's it's constantly um, estimating the minimum and the maximum right. at yeah. every point, and so it's trying to map that to the bit requirements on an FPGA. Exactly. Yeah, and it's using a fixed point scheme that assumes. Um, um, what kind of multiplication? In other words, if, if you have some random signal needing a random number of bits and it is going to get multiplied by another such signal, yeah. where's the binary point? That's a good question. Like, honestly, I'm so, uh, so I got the postdoc has been working very tightly with Jan on this very specific thing, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, like, I, I know like the general thing that they're doing, you know, like but the details, like I, I don't know, you know, like so uh so I think those questions would be like for uh for Jan actually. They're being, they're being discussed. So is there any discussion about language support for different types of numbers or different types of in other words, int versus fixed point. In other words, some numbers want to be between plus and minus one, yeah. but others really want to be integers, right? Yeah. So it'd be nice to not have to jam those into the same number type whereas normally we do because in floating point it doesn't matter right i mean yeah in floating point we can handle integers as well as plus or minus one so um it seems like there's got to at least be a lot of pressure to support in the language you know a, a first class integer and a, and, a, and a fixed point that's you know, soon to be but like a signal it, type. The signal type would be plus and minus one. But at the highest level, it's just going to be Faust anyway. Yeah. You know, like so, uh, you don't want to introduce any new language. Yeah, so you're not going to like, uh, like. That make it harder. We, yeah, <laughs> like. <laughs> 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 we like we want the end user to keep using Faust the way uh, they are using it. You know, well, you can you know, be backwards compatible. In other words, you could have a new type that's only meaningful. In this uh, fixed point output, context. I think ideally we don't want to change, like. Well, just add, not change, but add. Maybe add, yeah. Maybe like the advantage of adding that because if, if you can go, I mean, I think it should be possible to just you can go through and, and scale. Like if you're just dealing with you know, frequencies, then you don't need so much on. The, I mean, you know, you don't need so much on the right hand side of the binary point, but you need more on the left hand and, side. Um, yeah, that could be just figured out. Yeah. yeah. And like, just like, the left and the right. It's just another, kind of another thing, thing that's tricky. That's something we've been doing. And uh, yeah, another thing that's tricky about this, and uh, you know, like that we're uh, struggling a lot uh, right now with this, you know, is that uh, if you run your DSP algorithms at twenty five megahertz. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, then precision becomes even more important, you know, and uh, the frequency of an LFO becomes yeah. Well, there we go. <laughs> and so, uh, so like that's one thing we didn't think too much about. Like uh, when we started like working on those uh, like homemade DAX on the FPGA, you know, like but uh, but then we realized that uh, almost every uh, single oscillator uh, in Faust was completely out of tune at twenty five megahertz. You know, because uh, even though they are still Coded on floating points, like they don't have enough precision to yeah. sort of uh, like the the delta of the uh, phaser is so small. <laughs> that, you gotta go to doubles for that. Yeah, but even with we, we tried, even with doubles, like it's still like uh, sort of out of tune. You know, like and, uh, and like so so it's good to be ambitious uh, about running those things at a super high sampling rate, but it creates so many problems uh, with precision as well, you know, like, so, uh, so and, and maybe we're never going to make it, you know. Well, it's possible to leverage one of the strains of the dark horse alternative floating point number system that have come up uh, over the years, like, I know there's one called Unum, which uh, I, I don't know very much about, like, the name of the so, alternatives to build, like, the big point flow. Well, Unum, you know, in order to do a multiple, you have to do a big table with them. Yeah. Yeah. Big yep. point log. So, like, we're lucky that, uh, in the the team uh so now we have like a bigger team which is not just like gram but uh, it's like insa and uh, in area and, uh, and in the team uh there's like the world expert expert 
on a fixed point arithmetic on FPGAs. And, uh, and so like, it's a very niche thing. And uh, he made this thing called Flopoco and, uh, and it's something to optimize uh, like precision on FPGAs, especially in the context of uh, recursive IIR filters. And, uh, and so, uh, so he knows those things very well. And uh, like, personally, they're a bit beyond <laughs> my expertise, you know? And, uh, and like, he's helping a lot, you know, like, but, uh, but like, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, and uh, maybe it's never, I don't know, maybe we're never going to make it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very exploratory at this point, so. Uh, well, you can always, you know, run at a sampling rate that's appropriate for audio and then upsample for the output. Yeah, but then you don't really get the benefits of uh, say that you're. But you can't hear it. What benefit is there about 20 kilohertz? Yeah, but like if you're, uh, I don't know, like if you're doing FM, for example, you know, or things like this, you know, like uh, if you run your FM algorithm at uh, 25 megahertz, it completely gets ri get rid of artifacts, you know, or aliasing or whatever, you know. And it's like so, a Nova system. It's, yeah. It's, it's even, it's more virtual and it's like it's virtual analog that's really almost analog. Yeah, there we go, yeah. Well, there are other ways to achieve that, you know, interpolation will achieve that if you do the interpolation oh yeah that. no of course then but i don't know we're and like the thing with it with the fpg is that it's naturally more expensive to run things at 25 megahertz than uh, at 44 kilohertz you know and uh mm -hmm. like from a computational standpoint it's not really more that much more expensive you know and so uh so i'm like since we can so do it, you don't want to have multiple sampling rates of voice. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. All right. I will try to wrap this up and then I can uh, answer other questions. But uh, yeah, uh, another thing that we're doing is we're trying to have a fully operational VHDL Faust backend, which would basically allow us to get rid of uh, HLS, so high level uh, synthesis. And uh, those two things are connected. You know, I feel uh, if we can have the fixed point C uh, backend, then we can have the VHDL files back in as well, you know, and, uh, um, parallelizing code generated by Faust. So, uh, so Jan talked about this this morning, you know, and, uh, and so currently, uh, what Faust generates, uh, cannot really be pipelined, uh, very well, uh, because it's very sequential and, uh, and, you know, it goes Faust, uh, was always thought to run on a CPU or something like this, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so we need to, uh, better parallelize the code generated by Faust so that it works better, uh, on the FPGA. Uh, yeah, we want to continue to, uh, and this is more like the word for the end of today, you know, but uh, we want to continue to improve Faust to make it an industry grade tool, you know, and, uh, and currently there are still like things, uh, that needs to be, uh, done, you know, and, uh, we had this very brief conversation over lunch, uh, like facilitating linear algebra, I think really fits within this uh, context of uh, better supporting uh, any things to do like uh, matrix operations or uh, maybe dealing with vectors or things like this, you know, and, uh, and so like and tensors and uh, yeah, well, there we go. Yeah. And so, uh, so like that's, uh, you know, all these things are like we're thinking about them, you know, like, but, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, simple. Uh, yeah, we want to use this for active control. And again, like we have a project on this and uh, people are using uh, fast uh, to do this uh, already. So, uh, so, uh, so we're, we already have like prototypes of room active control, uh, like a very small scale, but uh, it's, uh, it's starting to, uh, to happen. Uh, we want to work more in spatial audio because we think that uh, there is a lot to do in this context and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you have any questions, well, you can ask them now or uh, send them to me uh, by email. And those are the slides of my presentation, and that's the website of the team. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? I think there were a lot of questions. I thought we were in the question and answer. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we should just go for a beer, you know. <laughs> so. Questions over beer. Um, so there were questions on the chat for sure. So yeah, we should go through those. Uh, will Faust 
emit any pipelining for the FPGA logic. Uh, can you talk more about how many cycles each sample takes? Okay, that's a, that's a, a short question with a very long answer. Right. Uh, so, uh, so currently, uh, the only uh, system that really works well in this context uh, is uh, our uh, compiler going through HLS, which is a high level uh, synthesis. And uh, and so uh, so in HLS uh, pipelining can be uh, managed using uh, pragmas and uh, and so uh, so we're uh, trying to automatically integrate those pragmas to the way the Faust code is generated. But in order to do pipelining, you also need to do better parallelization of Faust code and uh, and so uh, so we're. Uh, currently, we're not pipelining things very well. Uh, like that, that we we know that for sure, you know. And so, so in many cases, the performances that we have, uh, like the computational performances that we have uh, with Cifala, are not as good as what they should as what they should be, basically. And so, uh, so, uh, so we're we're working on it, you know. But uh, but like HLS is easier to deal with than uh, pure VHDL, but it's still very complicated. And, uh, and so, uh, so we're, uh, and we're not uh, expert, and there are very few experts on HLS in the world. And so, uh, so we're, we're getting better, like we work directly with people like Xilinx, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's taking some time. So, uh, so that was the first half of the question. And uh, how many cycles uh, for each sample? Uh, well, that completely depends on uh, what you're uh, running, you know, and uh, the complexity of your uh, algorithm, you know, and, uh, and if you're not pipelining at all, uh, then, uh, uh, well, you eat the bottle, well, you get the, well, you hit the bottleneck very, uh, very quickly. And uh, so I think a good example is uh, Judas's uh, Minimug uh, synthesizer, you know, and uh, this one uh, doesn't do almost any pipelining and it still runs on a fairly basic FPGA, you know, and, uh, and in that case, uh, like, I don't know how many cycles it's going to be, you know, like, but it's just going to be just enough so that within the clock of the FPGA that we use, which is 200 megahertz, no, sorry, 125 megahertz. Uh, it's gonna fit, you know, and uh, and uh, but if we were doing better pipelining. Uh, with one voice, uh, it's not polyphonic. <laughs> uh, but if we were doing better pipelining, uh, we would be able to fit much, much, much more. So, uh, uh, so you actually have an example of the mini mug Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. There is, uh, I think, there is a video on our website of this. You know, and, uh, and John Claude Rousset's son demonstrated it, right? Yeah, he had it here live. Yeah, actually, he demonstrated it here, you know, and uh, and all I can tell you is that it sounded exactly the same as on my computer. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, uh, it it had ten microseconds of latency, but uh, but like um, I couldn't really tell, you know. <laughs> so, one voice. Yeah, <laughs> but only one voice. So. Uh, uh, is there any? So I think there are other questions. So. Uh, I plan to build a 3D ambisonic system. I need 32 or more output. Do you know uh, where the Adafruit codec are uh, functional with the Zybo uh, 20? Oh, where? Yeah, well, whatever. Uh, yeah, like the, the Adafruit audio codecs are uh, compatible with the Zybo uh, Z720. Uh, it's already like working and uh, there is nothing else to do to make it work. Uh, however, uh, ambisonics, uh, I'm not sure if it's such a good idea. Like WFS works very well uh, because uh, it doesn't really imply any complex mathematical operations and, uh, and it can really be optimized in a way where you can limit the number of memory accesses that you're doing in the system. Uh, ambisonics uh, is more complex because uh, you actually have to do uh, complex mathematical operations for uh, decoding. And so, uh, so I'm not sure if uh, right now in the current state, it's necessarily a good idea to use an FPGA to do this. So uh, Pascal, uh, maybe don't use Cifala to implement your uh, ambisonic uh, system for now. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, GDs? GPT-4 knows HLS. Does it? I just it just wrote me a sign oscillator. I'm now asking for a biquad filter. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think it's gonna run? Oh, that's a good question. I would bet against that. Actually. <laughs> but it, it seems to know what it's talking about. I have a feeling it has more HLS input than Fox inputs. It might be the same one. I, you know, honestly, I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> I'm not so sure about this, like, because there are so little on HLS uh, on the web, you know, and, uh, uh, and like. Uh, well, it's in the weights. And so, yeah, David? But, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to play around over here. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> speculative software. But about the Amazonics, I was thinking you guys mentioned the decoder aspect of the Amazonics. But I was thinking that an encoder aspect of the Amazonics would still be best. A, a, a decoder, like going to like binaural or going to a single speaker, like a mono speaker, that's using filters. But encoding is just like spherical coordinates, yep. which is cheaper. So, like, if the, the person who asked the question about Amazonics, like, maybe you do want to use. Amazon's yeah, but I think he wants to make uh, like an ambisonic system in a room, basically. You know, you know, that was the that was yeah part of the question. So, uh, so if you are putting together an ambisonic system, uh, then you need uh, you need the decoder, right? And so, what's, uh, what's expensive about the decoder? Just the size and the code Yeah, you can you can do good well good enough. I mean, yeah. How much angular accuracy do you want? Yeah. That's so that that's a very good point. So uh, so we've been thinking about this, you know, like about like uh, just uh, using like tables <laughs> instead. Well, you can yeah. tables. tables. You can just there's um like a fourth order polynomial. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Linear interpolated tables are good too. Yeah. yeah. Well. I, I'm just like knowing like what do we have for now. I I think it might work, but uh, but like if someone is like, oh, I want to try to build this, uh, and uh, like m maybe you want to make sure that the that it it will work before you know like that that was because uh, there are a lot of performances issues for now, and uh, and so uh, so like I wouldn't. I would not recommend people to use this for uh, anything that's going to be like large scale or uh, complicated uh, projects, you know. And uh, but that those are all super good points, you know. And uh, and we, we thought about this, but uh, but it's just that there are so many uh, like more important problems that we have to solve for now. Like that, uh, but yeah. Well, um, all these uh, FPGAs come with like libraries of like various little stamps for things, right? So you could probably find a a cortic algorithm and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they must have extensive libraries, right? So can you bind to those as foreign functions in Faust code? Um, so for HLS, probably there, there is very little things for HLS. Like also the whole point of HLS is like uh, make your own IP from scratch and then integrate it to a more global uh, block design. You know, and of uh, course that's the way you deal now with FPGAs. You know, like you, you, it's like Max MSP basically. You know, like you, you have like this thing with uh, blocks, and uh, and then you wire them together. You know, and uh, and uh, and so. But isn't there an extensive library of blocks? There is an extensive library of blocks, uh, but uh, for most of them, you have to pay. Oh, <laughs> when, that's why they call it IP. Yeah. That's exactly. yeah. <laughs> and so, like, and, and they're not cheap. <laughs> like, uh, so, like, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do now is we're uh, trying to we're trying to make an ambisonic uh, microphone uh, based on an FPGA, uh, and that does like automatic uh, ambisonics encoding on the FPGA with like sixty four microphone caps, and uh, and so we. Uh, we wanted to get an Ethernet output to the microphone, and uh, and so uh, so Dante like forget about it, you know, it was, uh, but uh, but then we we wanted to use uh, AVB, uh, and they have uh, they have an IP for AVB. I forgot how much it is, but uh, like it's 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 like 
five or six thousand dollars, you know, and, and wow. so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, you, but then you can deploy it as much as you want. It's like you paid that one. I'm not sure. I don't know. Probably, yeah. I, I, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's you know, in the free open source yeah. software world, that's just not reasonable. But yeah, but we're trying to keep everything open source and uh, yeah. and like so we need a we need a big barn raising for all the nice blocks. So yeah. We need to all contribute blocks that are free. Well, after the Faust libraries, duties, I think that's your, uh, maybe that's your next big I'll project. It on my plate. <laughs> consider it on my plate. Well, Andy Moore used to say, I'll put a sleeve on it right away. <laughs> I, think, I think they all. The people who know to laugh know how things I think they all laugh by, the, by now. <laughs> you only have a minute to, to vamp in your. your... Uh, so there's a, a simulator for this too. There's a Zion Link software simulator. Oh, is it no good? I mean, it's going to take you a day. To... Oh. Whoops. Oh. I'm going to try to catch it before. Did I catch it? Probably so better off. Oh, yeah. Just it just timed out. Just a... It'll come back. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I do well, this every class. Uh, I think we're. We're done? I think we're done, right? Uh, well, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone in the room and also thank you to everyone uh, online because there are still a lot of people. Uh, and uh, I hope you're not in Europe because it's probably very late for Saturday night. So. Uh, oh, also, like just for the, the fun uh, story about this. So uh, in Europe, uh, well, in many countries, uh, this weekend is Ascension weekend, and uh, and so like people are on vacation, you know, like uh, it's like a four days weekend, you know, and uh, and so so uh, so like it's a big bank holiday, you know, and uh, and so we organized Faust Day uh, the Saturday night of this bank holiday weekend, you know, and so a lot of people wrote me and were like, what the fuck. <laughs> and so, uh, but yeah, there were a lot of people, you know, and Jan and Stefan actually made it, you know, and so uh, anyway, we hope you had fun uh, and we're very sorry about this morning and uh, the uh, technical uh, problems, which hopefully will be uh, fixed uh, at some point. And uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. And if you want to go for a beer, uh, which we all, or, or something else, uh, which we, which we all very much deserve at this point, uh, please uh, follow me. So Tresitor, right? Tresitor, yeah. Treehouse or coffee house? Yeah, treehouse outside, I guess. Yeah, the, the picnic tables behind. Yeah. Okay. I think that's uh, in the sort of enclosed area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you.